inside churches across England. It's jolly hard. A resurrection of sorts. That's the vision of the future. Plus, everything's going wrong. Desperate times. I need this money. Call for desperate measures. A bank robbery just made sense. One con's last heist. I'm gonna make it out of this. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Can you imagine living in Europe under fear that wherever you walk, there might be some terrorist? And the so-called adherents to the religion of peace have struck again, this time killing almost 30 people uh, in the heart of Europe, Co coordinated bombings in Brussels. A suicide bomber struck at the airport. Terrorists also bombed a subway station near the headquarters of the European Union. The attacks come just days after police arrested the main suspect in the Paris attacks. Charlene Aaron has the story. Two explosions rocked the Brussels airport as hundreds of passengers were trying to check in during the early morning rush hour. Passengers were evacuated from the terminal where the blasts occurred. You felt the explosion? Yeah, I feel, yeah, and I put that in my suitcase and glass over my side. We only saw some smashed windows and uh, we didn't get any information. I walked through a mess, a load of stuff, uh, glass splitters, smoke, water dripping from the ceiling. We had to walk through puddles and we were evacuated. And separate strikes were reported in various locations across the city. Another blast at the subway station was right next to the European Union headquarters. The airports and subway systems are shut down. British airports are increasing security and Prime Minister Cameron is convening the government's emergency committee after the explosions in Brussels. Officials called the blasts terrorism, similar to the attacks that took place in Paris in November that killed 130 people. The bombings happened only days after the prime suspect in the Paris attacks, Salah Absalom, was arrested in Brussels. Terrorism analyst Eric Stackelbeck earlier told CBN News about the growing threat in Brussels and other parts of Europe. This tiny neighborhood called Molenbeek on the fringes of Brussels has really become a problem spot, not only for, Brussels, uh, for Belgium, but for Europe as a whole. It's really become an incubator for radical jihad, and we've seen several residents from that neighborhood. It has become a real hotbed for radical imams and ISIS sympathizers. We've seen several residents of that neighborhood leave Molenbeek and go to Syria to join ISIS. And now they're coming back and we're seeing the bitter fruits of that. The terror threat level in Belgium has been raised to its highest level at all transportation hubs. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. What does a society do, a free society? It cannot allow itself to be victimized, as is happening in Belgium. They've got to take action, and they've got to take swift action. Our CBN News European reporter, Dale Hurd, is with us. Dale, you've reported from Brussels. Uh, it has become a hotbed of jihadists. Tell us about it. I called it uh, the jihadi barracks of Europe. It's been a welcome home for extremists for years. Four years ago, when I needed to talk to a terrorist in Belgium, I called him on his cell phone, and I met him out in the open in a cafe in Antwerp, and he's now in prison. So that's the kind of environment that they've had there. I've wondered why this hasn't happened sooner. Well, they, why do they pick Brussels? Is it because of NATO or the EU? or because there are a lot of terrorists in Brussels. So, you know, one of the stops was near the European Union. But <coughs> security has been so lax there, it's a very easy target. I was with EU leaders a few weeks ago, and, and every time I'm in the European Union, I'm struck by the lack of security relative to what you would see in the U.S. Capitol. And I always wondered, do they really think that they're never going to be hit? And maybe they aren't, but they were. Uh, as you say, this airport, subway, easy targets, I mean, do they come in to Brussels from other countries looking for uh, opportunities to strike? No, and you know what? This is an important point. Uh, after the Paris attacks, the governments in Europe uh, talked about the threat from the Middle East, from ISIS. The threat was already in Europe, okay? The terrorists were already there, living in Molenbeek. 
Um, but uh, the, see, Belgium is going to need help to deal with this. You, uh, we used to joke that if you walked through Brussels airport with a hand grenade and you dropped it, a soldier would stop you and hand it back to you, okay? Even after 9-11, I thought security was, uh, frankly, a joke. And I'm not sure Belgium is up to the job uh, to handle this. Well, is it the politically correct philosophy that's causing this, so they just don't care? Yeah, I, th I think that there's brainwashing has occurred. I think that tomorrow uh, people will really appear on the streets with real posters and apologize to Muslims for provoking this attack. Uh, and in the media, you have all this politically correct pressure on politicians to not be racist. Okay, and to not single out a group because anyone could commit these attacks, except only one group commits these attacks. You say you were being facetious, of course, but is there truth in that, that they literally would apologize to the Muslims for, for, for inciting them to this violence? They've done that in Sweden after the sex attacks. Uh, uh, people went, came out and said uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, I'm sorry that you've been singled out for this because, you know, you're, you have such a hard time here in Sweden and we treat you so badly. Bill, what's the solution or is there one? you think they'll ever find a solution to this? Well, I'll tell you, this is a stupid strategy by Muslims, but you know what? It isn't a strategy. You know, the right strategy would be what a terrorist in Belgium told me four years ago, which is we're going to have a lot of children and simply take over the country that way. Blowing up people is not a strategy. It is, it, we as Christians know that it's a blood sacrifice to Allah. This is a spiritual service that they're doing when they blow themselves up and they blow up infidels. Um, it's not a good strategy. It's religion. Dale Hurd, thank you for the tremendous insightful uh, perspective you've been bringing on this. And ladies and gentlemen, isn't it amazing that we won't open our eyes. It's clear in the Quran what uh, Muhammad said. It's clear the teachings in these uh, jihadi uh, uh, madrasas and in the jihadi uh, uh, other enclaves, wherever uh, uh, this teaching goes forth. But yet nobody will act. Well, in other news, voters are going to the polls again today in the presidential primaries, a day after the leading candidates made their case for supporting Israel. And some were very articulate. I heard uh, John Kasich, incredible what he had to say about Israel. But the Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, had a huge conference in Washington. David Brody brings us that story. The big pro-Israel conference always attracts a bipartisan tier A list of political bigwigs looking to show their solidarity with Israel. Presidential candidate Hillary Clinton is one of them. Palestinian leaders need to stop inciting violence, stop celebrating terrorists as martyrs, and stop paying rewards to their families. While Hillary Clinton showed up at AIPAC here in Washington, Bernie Sanders did not. But the real big event was those three Republican candidates on stage, specifically Donald Trump, who had some work to do in front of a pro-Israeli audience. Trump has been under criticism for saying that as president, he wants to be seen as neutral when trying to negotiate a potential peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. His main challenger, Ted Cruz, tried to hit him on that. Let me be very, very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. America will stand unapologetically with the nation of Israel. But Trump's remarks were anything but neutral. In a crucial speech where he read off a teleprompter for the first time, Trump delivered an over-the-top pro-Israel address. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. The Palestinians must come to the table knowing that the bond between the United States and Israel is absolutely, totally unbreakable. And they must come to the table willing to accept that Israel is a Jewish state and it will forever exist as a Jewish state. John Kasich, who's a distant third in this presidential race, didn't go after Trump. Instead, he played the leadership card. As the candidate in this race with the deepest and most far-reaching foreign policy and national security experience, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I don't need on-the-job training. Beyond presidential politics, the conference's main goal is to get participants active on issues that matter to Israel. Among the key concerns is the growing anti-Israel BDS movement. It stands for boycott, divestment and sanctions. The movement is trying to economically isolate Israel from other countries in various ways because of their so-called occupation of Palestinian land. CBN was on hand at the conference trying to do their part to help. CEO Gordon Robertson presented CBN's new documentary. It's called The Hope, The Rebirth of Israel. It explains what happened in the 50 years leading up to the founding of the modern state of Israel. And the purpose of the documentary is significant. The more I got into it, uh, the more I decided that uh, the world needed to see this and needed to be educated, particularly in light of what is currently going on with the BDS movement uh, to try to boycott Israel. The more people are educated on how Israel actually came to be, what are the historical facts, uh, the better able they are to argue against BDS. There's no doubt Israel needs America's support, especially after a tense relationship with the Obama administration. So now these tens of thousands pro-Israel supporters here in Washington are looking for a new president who will stand stronger with Israel than ever before. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, David. I watched uh, John Kasich incredible. He hit every hot button you can hit, and he did it very eloquently. I didn't see Trump's speech, but it looks like he did a good job. So, mm -hmm. But that's the biggest APAC conference I think they've ever had. Huge it was an attendance. enormous group of people. Wonderful. Yeah. Really wonderful. I want to say Gordon mentioned uh, the DVD that we've done called The Hope, which mm. does document those 50 years before Israel became a state. And we want you to know it's available to you as well for a gift of $10. You can get it in DVD or Blu-ray. You can do that by calling 1-800-759-0700 or log on to cbn.com slash Israel The Hope. It's an amazing DVD filled with information that reinforces why we stand with mm. Israel and the history of that great nation. We want you to have your copy. So uh, call now or log on now. And for $10, the hope is yours. I think you'll really enjoy it. Well, up next, for years, churches across Great Britain have sat empty, but not anymore. When we reopened, one of the children said to some other kids, come into our church, it's great. I think it's basically much more welcoming now. Hear why these churches have become a destination for an entire community when we return. Well, this is Passion Week, and Christians all around the world are preparing for Easter. But some believers in rural England are wondering if their churches will be holding services next year because of their shrinking congregations. Now there are new plans to save those historic church buildings and to help make the church the center of the community once again. John Jessup brings us this story. Tucked away in England's magnificent landscape lies the small village of Peter Church. At the annual Crafts Fair, the Anglican Church bustles with activity. But this kind of church could become an endangered species, in part because of changing demographics as people migrate to the city. A Church of England report shows more than half of its churches are in rural areas, although only 17% of the population lives there. This means smaller congregations, fewer resources, and a bleak future given the average age of attendees hovers around 55. A lot of it is about the demographics, but also, you know, we have to be realistic. Secularization amongst the indigenous population. And there's no two ways about that. In the diocese serving Herefordshire, England's most sparsely populated county, there are over 400 Anglican churches. Most hundreds of years old, historic landmarks worth saving. The report offers some proposals, such as festival churches, which would only open on special days like Christmas and Easter. Closing, locking that door for the bulk of the year will be a sad day. However, one has to be realistic and looking at it the other way, it's jolly hard to keep, maintain, uh, pay the bills on historic buildings.
This 3,000 year old yew tree has certainly seen a lot of change over the years in this English village and its church dating back to the 8th century has found a way to keep up with the changing times. When this church was built, this area would have belonged to the people uh, of the village. So this was the centre of the community. We've lost that over the years, and the church has become more and more a sort of sacred space only, that only the special few can go into. That is what we are trying to reverse. The answer came from the government, and an opportunity to use the church's size to help with its Every Child Matters program. But there would need to be an extensive makeover. The inside of the church was quite cold and damp and dark and not very uplifting. Their mission, update the church while keeping its history. A four-year process led to an award-winning design welcoming villagers for more than church services. But our architect said stand in the middle of the nave and turn and look at the new section. That's the vision of the future, but it's very important to still turn and look to the traditional part of the church and marry the two together in the middle. The beauty of the church was maintained. It's sort of ancient beauty, and then there's a sort of contemporary beauty as well. There were one or two perhaps who still would rather the pews, but um, in the main, people have just seen that, that instead of it being used for an hour on a Sunday morning, it's now used right through each and every day. St. Peter's Center offers everything from senior events to yoga classes, and the bell tower now doubles as a branch of the local library. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, at the moment, the, um, the main library in, in the city is closed for refurbishment or something. So the fact that we've got a county library in the village and yet in the city they haven't got it at the moment. It's amazing. When craft vendor Caroline Gilbert moved her young family here, St. Peter's caught her attention with its parent toddler group. It's a beautiful building and for a bit small village that takes half an hour to get to a big town. Uh, it's great to have, have the facilities. When we reopened, one of the children was out in the uh, playing field out there and said to some other kids, come into our church, it's great. I think it's basically much more welcoming now. While the Church of England acknowledges there's no one-size-fits-all solution, they see St. Peter's as a model of success, making the future brighter than before. John Jessup, CBN News, in Peter Church, England. I've got mixed feelings on that one. I just don't know. You know, I'm sorry. It's what's happening. You know, an established church doesn't work. And, uh, you know, the free church has always been what's vibrant. I, I visited the Archbishop of York, uh, and I'm, he's spirit-filled. And at least he was when I, when I talked to him. And they have a vibrant congregation. They've got all kinds of people in there praising God. That's what they need, not a place of commerce. But uh, anyhow, uh, I... Whatever they want to do, that's their business. Mm -hmm. Beautiful building. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful building downtown Norfolk called Freemason Abbey, yes. and they have a, a restaurant, restaurant down there. Used to be pretty good. I don't think it's very good anymore. But anyway, um, it's a pretty building, but you just say. You get free coupons. <laughs> you get free coupons. <laughs> right. Whatever you get. But anyhow, uh, there's no longer any worship there. It is a, is a church that has been decommissioned. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, coming up, a bank robber gets busted. There's no way out. They're going to give me all this time. I was on my last hope suicidal. How am I going to make it out of this? Watch as he makes a plea deal with God when we return. Reggie Foreman was in a tight spot, a six by nine foot spot, actually. The one time bank robber was sitting in a jail cell and staring at the bars. That's where, where he cried out to a person he hardly knew and he definitely hated. I remember a time when my mother had got real violent to where she was throwing wrenches and tools at me. And I remember running out the house of the street just running. Reggie Foreman grew up in the Chicago projects in a home as violent as the streets. 
His parents never married, his father had left to serve in the army, and his teenage mother was an addict with a short fuse. What made it worse was I had a brother, but we had different fathers. It seemed like the love that I was supposed to get, he got it. I mean, if I would argue with him, if I would say something to him, he would tell, I would get hit. She would take his side. So Reggie turned to the streets for acceptance. There, he learned to fight to survive. It also gave him an outlet for his rage. I was angry at my mom, angry at the streets. I wanted to stop being bullied. I wanted to stop being teased and ran home every day. I wanted them to know that if you touch me, I'll hurt you. Then his mother began prostituting. Reggie wanted out. He went to live with his father, who had moved to Miami after the army. He was also married and very wealthy. It was a new home and a new life for Reggie, but his father had high expectations. He always told me, you can be better than me, but it was like he was forcing me. My father's trying to turn me into this productive citizen. But I'm 14 years old, I wanna watch hip hop and rap. Determined to do his own thing, Reggie joined a gang. He was constantly getting into fights and eventually kicked out of two schools. He discovered his father had been dealing in drugs and prostitutes. Now this is very hard because my father was suits and suspenders in the clean cut. Nobody would believe that my father would be doing this. This is like a movie, unbelievable, that my father's a pimp. He started disappearing. I would see him every other couple of weeks and I started getting in more and more trouble. Eventually, Reggie's father sent him to live in Alabama with his grandmother, hoping she might influence him to get his life turned around. I remember my grandmother said, you have to trust in God. I didn't understand how a loving God would have let so much turmoil go on. How did God love me? I thought, okay, when I get 30 and get married, I'll stop what I'm doing. Reggie moved back to Miami when he was 18, trying to make it on his own. But with no job and no money, he resorted to desperate measures. I'm at a house with no power, no lights, and everything's going wrong. And I got friends that are making money, $50, $100 a day doing robberies and stuff or selling drugs. So a bank robbery just made sense. Yeah, tonight. Y'all gonna be ready? And we gonna get in and out. I was on my last hope suicidal. I need this money. They pulled off the heist, getting away with $22,000. But police tracked Reggie down, and he was convicted of armed robbery. I'm gonna make it out of this. There's no way out. They're gonna give me all this time. This is what I was told, God will help you. He'll help you out. Pray to him. So I start praying and reading the Bible. But when he received two consecutive nine-year sentences, Reggie unleashed a lifetime of anger and hurt. I was cursing, crying out to God, where the F were you? Where were you when these guys were chasing me home? Where were you when my mother was beating me? Where were you when I was hungry? And I remember crying out to God, and um, I just remember saying, God, I really need your help. And I was, I was on my knees crying suicidal. I was repenting after I, I, I lashed out at God. And then right after that, I felt a warm peace come over me. I felt like somebody was in the cell with me. Burden started to lift. Hope came in. He spoke to me and said, I got a purpose for you. It wasn't just, I want you to be saved and go to heaven. He showed me at that moment, I have a purpose for all of that. I was like, wow, this almighty God has a purpose for me. That day, Reggie gave his life to Christ. He was released early on an appeal in 2008. Today, Reggie is married and the CEO of his own clothing line. He travels nationwide, sharing how God has loved him through all he has done. God has a purpose no matter what your pain is. My purpose is to help people know that God is real and that he's love. I can't complain, I can't give up. I know what God can do. What a testimony. I have a purpose for you. I have a purpose. You know something? He's got a purpose for every one of us. And there's one thing you can do that none of us can do. I can't do what you can do. I can't possibly do it. Some of the great preachers can't do it. The great teachers, they can't do what you can do. You are special. And there's only one way that God can be glorified in a particular way, and that's through you. You are unique, and he has a purpose for you. Can you believe that? He's got something for you to do. Think of Reggie. Mother's a prostitute. Father's a pimp. Beaten up when he was a little kid. It's amazing what happened. 
But God speaks to him and says, I've got a purpose for you. Look, the Lord loves you. And right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do something. Right now, I want you to pray with me and let God speak to you. Listen to what he's going to say right now. These words, Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Jesus, I know you died for me. I know you rose again that I might live. God, I come to you right now. And I know that you have a purpose for me. Show me that purpose. I receive you as Savior and I make you Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer, and thank you that you've come into my heart. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to do something. I want you to get up, go to your telephone, or if you've got a phone in your hand, dial the number. It's 1-800-759-0700. Say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord, and now he's going to reveal his purpose and plan to me. And we want to send you something that will help you. It's called uh, a new day. We'll give that to you. Uh, But uh, that's not important. But what's important is you call. Telephones are available. I want you to go right now, 1-800-759-0700. Okay? Terry. Well, still ahead, it's a necessity of life, and yet over a billion people don't have access to it. What moves me the most is to think about mothers losing their children because of something that we could take care of. Watch One Church bring water to the world when we come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The percentage of Americans who pray or believe in God hit an all-time low in 2014, but a slightly higher percentage do now believe in an afterlife. That is according to new research from San Diego State, Florida Atlantic, and Case Western Reserve. The biggest declines in faith came among younger Americans from ages 18 to 29. The research team leader said the large declines in religious practice among young adults are also further evidence that millennials are the least religious generation in memory and possibly in American history. Turning now to today's family entertainment news, the new faith-based films Miracles from Heaven had a strong opening at the box office. It finished number three for the weekend, and it's brought in more than $18 million since it opened Wednesday. Audiences gave the film an A-plus cinema score, which could indicate it will keep doing well in the weeks ahead. The movie stars Jennifer Garner along with Queen Latifah and tells the true story of how young Anna Beam was born with a rare, incurable disease, but is healed after she survives a freak accident. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of The 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Better water, better jobs, that's the theme of this year's World Water Day. The quantity and quality of available water is critically important to life. That clarion call was heard by one Texas church who teamed with CBN to drench the world. Take a look. Every 20 seconds, one child dies because they don't have access to safe drinking water. It's a troubling number that touched the heart of Pastor Rod Brewer of Family Cathedral Church in Mesquite, Texas. What moves me the most is to think about mothers losing their children because of something that we could take care of. Pastor Brewer reached out to CBN to find out how his church could be a part of the solution. For nearly two decades, over 6.2 million people have benefited from more than 15,000 wells built by CBN. CBN has the Uh, personnel, projects, and equipment already in place. So by working together, we can both accomplish more on less. If a church has a dream, a desire to do something, chances are CBN is already there doing the heavy lifting. And by coming together, 
we can both accomplish more. Pastor Brewer learned that one well could give desperate communities the clean water they need to survive and thrive. We threw it around the staff, and the next thing you know, we came up with this vision we were going to do 25 wells over the next year. With each well costing $1,800, they would need commitment and support from the congregation. On World Water Day in 2015, Pastor Brewer and church leaders made their appeal. The staff handed out bottles of dirty drinking water to see for themselves what millions have to drink every day. And we really broke it down all the way down to uh, the single moms could participate if they gave $3 a week. And so we put value on no matter what your social status is, no matter what your financial status is, we put value on you getting on board and playing your part. The church responded. So as they came down and gave their uh, commitment cards, we had mock water wells up with water buckets around them, and everybody came to the altar and put their commitment cards in the bucket. After counting the cards, the staff was astonished. That day, the church gave more than enough to surpass their goal of 25 wells. It's kind of one of those moments, you know, we realized we had shot way too low and God was capable of so much more than what we had dreamed about. I was beside myself. I, I, could, I had to take off running. So I was so excited and it was just, a, it was a wonderful, joyous uh, Sunday morning as we knew that we were on our way to, to go exceeding what we had planned to do for the world. By the end of the year, the church sponsored 75 wells to be constructed in several countries. A wall at the sanctuary entrance puts their giving in perspective. A drop of water for each well. Also, photos and testimonies of the people they've helped. Lord, we give God all of the glory. And it's exciting to know that this church on the other side of the world has literally saved thousands of lives of not only little kids, but uh, young people, men and women, yeah, and the boys and the girls. But that's a very exciting thing uh, and not a temporary thing, but an ongoing thing. The church says partnership with CBN made their vision a reality. I would challenge any church uh, listening to what we're sharing today. Uh, pastors, get a vision. Maybe just start with one well. It may take you a year to build one well, but you know what? At the end of the day, it'd be a good thing. It'll be a good thing. You will save lives. A local church going beyond its walls and above the limits to provide clean, safe water for those in need. Well, I think personally my response is just a, a, a thankfulness for God just doing exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think or even imagine. That's His promise, you know. But we have to take the first step out. I love what this church is doing. And it is safe to say that the power of one church to make a difference is immeasurable. You know, you looked at the story of these people who had such a heart for those who didn't have clean water. That's a lot of the world. You and I go to our tap every day and we cook with fresh water, we drink fresh water. We, it's available to us. We bathe when we want to, shower when we want to, have indoor plumbing. The rest of the world doesn't live like that. But you and I have a great opportunity to make a difference. This is national, not national, this is World Water Day today, and we're in Living Water Month. Will you make a commitment today to do something to help others like this? You can't imagine how many people around the world don't do anything every day, but spend their time just finding a way to gather water. And the water that they get is not drinkable, but they use it anyway because it's all that's available to them. Help us, help us. If you're a pastor watching today, come on board with CBN. Sponsor some of these wells around the world. If you're an individual, be the person inside your church that makes that happen. You do it by calling 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to be a part of the water well movement that's going on there at CBN. We've been digging wells around the world for years, and we invite you to be a part of that. Listen, when you join the 700 Club, you are a part of that. That's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And our way of saying thank you to you for joining the 700 Club is to send you Pat's latest teaching, Heaven, what God has prepared for those who love Him. There'll be fresh water up there, don't you know? <laughs> and this is, Pat, what Teddy from Kettering, Ohio says, the best teaching about heaven I've ever seen. Pat answered questions on many people's minds. Can't thank you enough for the Heaven oh, DVD. God bless you. And we want people to know this is yours. It's our gift to you Amen. when you join the 700 Club. So call now.
Amen. Wonderful day to start. Well, World Water Day isn't the only thing that we're celebrating today because we're going to be breaking out the candles and the cake. It's Pat's birthday. Yay. But first, we're going to answer your email questions. Helen says, if you know someone is committing tax fraud, should you report them? Another round of Bring It On. It's only fitting he should do this on his birthday, don't you think? Don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> hey. hey. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Well, welcome back to the 700 Club. We're going to answer some of your email in our Brig and Odd segment now. And Pat, this first one comes from Helen, who says, if you know someone is committing tax fraud and receiving a refund based on lies, should you inform the IRS? It seems like they're stealing from people. I think uh, somebody who would turn a friend into the IRS <laughs> is not a friend. <laughs> is, is, is the lowest of the low. Go to that person and say, listen, uh, you're cheating the government. You really ought to stop this. But should you turn them in? No way. I just don't think that's what yeah. we ought to do. All right. I would agree with you. <laughs> this is Cheryl who says, my daughter is planning a wedding and would like a pastor to perform the ceremony. However, she and her fiance don't belong to a church. Every pastor she talked to said they have to go to marriage counseling before he can marry them. Now they're thinking about getting a justice of the peace to marry them. Does God recognize these marriages? Well, I mean, God represents, uh, uh, recognizes a commitment that you make to each other that you're going to live together. But uh, I, I think what these pastors are doing is telling you something that you need to know. You need counseling, and you start off life <clears throat> without knowing what it is you need to do. I, I think uh, these pastors are doing you a great favor, and you ought to take their advice and, and listen to what they have to tell you. You know, most of the time, I think people are afraid they're going to tell you that you shouldn't marry each other, but really yeah. they're there to give you wise advice sure. on how to be happily married. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, this is Karen Pat who says, my husband has a bad habit of using four-letter words. We're both Christians, and it really bothers me that he does this, especially around my adult sons. I usually tell him to stop, and I've prayed about it too. What can I say that would be helpful to him? Well, what do they say about profanity? It's the... Uh expression of a sin-sick mind trying to speak forcefully. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting what we call four little words. If you look back at the origins of them, the Anglo-Saxons were the poor and the Normans were the rich. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you find all these words, you know, the F word and the S word and all those words, they're the expressions of the poor in England to describe various bodily functions. And we've made them into curse words. So, uh, but uh, I think uh, all that does, the cursing part, shows that your husband is uneducated and he doesn't have yeah. a good enough vocabulary. <laughs> That's and you right. Ought to tell it to him. All right? A vocabulary book. <laughs> okay. This is Marianne who says, I was healed of cancer in 2010. I want to know if I disobey Jesus, can he take away his blessing and healing? I'm being consumed with condemnation for getting involved with an unbeliever and going to him with my problems. I tried to bring him to the Lord, but he doesn't care to hear anything about it. Um, look, I recommend you break off that relationship because you're obviously ashamed of it. Uh, but is the Lord going to withdraw his blessing? I don't think so. Uh, but <clears throat> it's if, you know, the Bible says, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence with the Lord. And your heart condemns you, so you come to God and you're asking Him for something while your own heart is condemning you. So whatever it is you're doing with this guy, I, I guess you're... I don't know if you're having sex. You're not saying that. It's, it's you're saying when well, you gave Him your problems. I don't know what you're talking about, yeah. but in any event, uh, I, I recommend breaking that off, okay? This is David who says, Hi, Pat. Am I sinning by watching movies with swearing and taking the Lord's name as a swear word? I don't swear myself. Well, it's hard to go to a movie today that doesn't have that, isn't it? You know, it? It, it's, it's such uh, grossness. But, uh, you know, you do, if you go to a movie, you have bought a ticket. Yeah. And you have therefore given your money to encourage that. 
uh, if you watch on television and you're part of a rating system, then they've rated you as a thousand homes or something. Uh, I, I don't know what to say, but the Apostle Paul said, if we don't associate with the ungodly in this world, it needs we would have to leave the world. The world is ungodly, and uh, we're pretty hard to, to get away from all the profanity and the grossness that's out there. Well, that's all the time we have for questions right. today. We are always grateful to hear from you. Don't go away just yet, because we do have a special celebration right around the corner. Pat Robertson turns 86 years young, so stay with us. We'll be back to celebrate. Wow, look at that. Well, this isn't all of us, but some of us have gathered to celebrate I'm your 86th birthday for this just a couple amazing. of minutes yeah. with all of you at home. And we just wish you a, a happy, well, wonderful, health-filled day and all, year. All the above. And I have my trophy wife. I got this, <laughs> this, this little girl. And she is. <laughs> my dear wife. So what are his expectations? Do you have to cook tonight or are y'all going out? We're going out. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of wisdom, Dee Dee, a lot a of lot wisdom. Of wisdom. <laughs> a lot of wisdom. But we have also Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Elizabeth yeah. come up here because she's come all the way from Dallas. She's so sweet. This is my oldest daughter Happy here. Happy birthday, Daddy. Hey, darling. <laughs> <laughs> so great to have Don't you I together. Have lovely ladies in my family. They keep me young. You have lovely ladies. You have a big family. You, ha you all are a small village, I think. <laughs> we have four children, and then we have 14 grandchildren, and we have seven great-grandchildren, and more coming. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The There's blessings. still seven weddings. Seven wow. weddings. With the great grand, yeah. uh, the grandchildren, so and you all do those well. <laughs> oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, we've but got this is a, a great celebration. delicious cake here, but we just want to say thank you to you for well, your vision you. and your leadership, and yeah. and we just love and admire you. Hitherto hath the Lord helped me. He's given me strength. You know, you you keep going, and you don't yeah. feel any different. And uh, I guess eighty is the new sixty or something. Or well, 60. we sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We're going with that. <laughs> We're going with that. Dee Dee, you are the expert at this, and I always kind of balk a little. How do I cut this, or would you like it's to do so the favor? pretty, but go ahead and cut a piece, dear. I'll hold the plate. <laughs> All right. Look at that, see? Bless you. Oh, well. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. God bless all of you. Thank you.